The Cave of the Ancients, written by T. Labsang Rampa, narrated by Clay Lomakayu. Forward. This is a book about the occult and about the powers of man. It is a simple book in that there are no foreign words, no Sanskrit, nothing of dead languages. The average person wants to know things, does not want to guess at words which the average author does not understand either. If an author knows his job, he can write in English without having to disguise lack of knowledge by use of a foreign language. Too many people get caught up in mumbo-jumbo. The laws of life are simple indeed. There is no need at all to dress them up with mystic cults or pseudo-religions. Nor is there need for anyone to claim divine revelations. Anyone can have the same revelations if they work for it. No religion holds the keys of heaven, nor will one be forever damned because he enters a church with his hat on instead of his shoes off. In Tibet Lama Seri's entrances bear the inscription, A thousand monks, a thousand religions. Believe what you will. If it embraces, do as you would be done by. You will get by when the final call comes. Some say that inner knowledge can only be obtained by joining this cult or that cult and paying a substantial subscription, too. The laws of life say, Seek and you shall find. This book is the fruit of a long life, training cult from the greater lamasseries of Tibet and from powers which were gained by a very close adherence to the laws. This is knowledge taught by the ancients of old, and is written in the pyramids of Egypt, in the high temples of the Andes, and in the greatest repository of occult knowledge in the world, the highlands of Tibet. Tilab Sang Rampa Chapter 1 The evening was warm, deliciously, unusually warm for the time of the year. Gently rising on the windless air, the sweet scent of incense gave tranquillity to our mood. Far away the sun was setting in a blaze of glory behind the high peaks of the Himalayas, tinting the snow-clad mountain tops a blood red, as if in warning of the blood which would drench Tibet in the days to come. Lengthening shadows crept slowly towards the city of Lhasa, from the twin peaks of the Patala and our own Chakpori. Below us, to the right, a belated caravan of traders from India wended their way to the Pago Kaling, a western gate. The last of the devout pilgrims hurried with unseemly haste on their circuit of the Lingkor Road, as if afraid of being overtaken by the velvet darkness of the fast-approaching night. The Kichu, or Happy River, ran merrily along on its endless journey to the sea throwing up bright flashes of light as tribute to the dying day. The city of Lhasa was agleam with the gold and glow of butter lamps. From the nearby Patala, a trumpet sounded at the end of the day, its notes rolling and echoing across the valley, rebounding from rock surfaces and returning to us with altered timber. I gazed at the familiar scene, gazed across at the Patala, Hundreds of windows a-twinkle as monks of all degree went about their business at the close of the day. At the top of the immense building by the golden tombs, a solitary figure, lonely and remote, stood watching. As the last rays of the sun sank below the mountain ranges, a trumpet sounded again, and the sound of deep chanting rose from the temple below. Swiftly the last vestiges of light faded. Swiftly the stars in the sky became a blaze of jewels set in a purple background. A meteor flashed across the sky and flared into a burst of final flaming glory before falling to the earth as a pinch of smoking dust. A beautiful night, Lab sang, said a well-loved voice. A beautiful night indeed, I replied as I swiftly rose to my feet in order that I might bow to the Lama Mingar Dondap. He sat by the side of a wall and motioned for me to sit also. Pointing upwards, he said, Do you realize that people, you and I, may look like that? I gazed at him dumbly. How could I look like stars in the night sky? The Lama was a big man, handsome and with a noble head. Even so, he did not look like a collection of stars. He laughed at my bemused expression. 
Literal as usual, laughed Sang. Literal as usual. He smiled. I meant to imply that things are not always what they seem. If you wrote Om Mani Padme Om, so large that it filled the whole valley of Lhasa, people would not be able to read it. It would be too large for them to grasp. He stopped and looked at me to make sure that I was following his explanation and then continued. In the same way, the stars are so large that we cannot determine what they really form. I looked at him as if he had taken leave of his senses. The stars forming something? The stars were, well, stars. Then I thought of writing so large that it filled the valley, and so became unreadable because of its size. The gentle voice went on. Think of yourself shrinking, shrinking, becoming as small as a grain of sand. How would I look to you then? Suppose you became even smaller, so small that the grain of sand was as large as a world to you. Then what would you see of me? He stopped and looked piercingly at me. Well, he asked, what would you see? I sat there and gaped, brain paralyzed at the thought, mouth open like a newly landed fish. You would see, Lab Sang, the Lama said, a group of widely dispersed worlds floating in darkness. Because of your small size, you would see the molecules of my body as separate worlds with immense space in between. You would see worlds rotating around worlds. You would see suns which were the molecules of certain psychic centers. You would see a universe. My brain creaked. I would almost swear that the machinery above my eyebrows gave a convulsive shudder with all the effort I was expending in order to follow all this strange, exciting knowledge. My guide, the Lama Mingar Dondap, reached forward and gently raised my chin. Lab sang. He chuckled. Your eyes are becoming crossed with the effort to follow me. He sat back laughing and gave me a few moments in which to recover somewhat. Then he said, Look at the material of your robe. Feel it. I did so, feeling remarkably foolish as I gazed at the tattered old garment I wore. The Lama remarked, It is cloth, somewhat smooth to the touch. You cannot see through it. But imagine seeing it to a glass which magnified it by ten. Think of the thick strands of yak wool, each strand ten times thicker than you see it here. You would be able to see light between the strands, but magnify it by a million, and you would be able to ride a horse through it, except that each strand would be too huge to climb over. It made sense to me now that it was pointed out. I sat and thought. Nodding, as the Lama said, Like a decrepit old woman, sir. I said at last, Then all life is a lot of space sprinkled with worlds. Not quite so simple as that, he replied. But sit more comfortably, and I will tell you a little knowledge we discovered in the cave of the ancients. Cave of the ancients? I exclaimed, full of avid curiosity. You were going to tell me about that expedition. Yes, yes, he soothed, so I will. But first, let us deal with man and life, as the ancients in the days of Atlantis believed them to be. I was secretly far more interested in the cave of the ancients which an expedition of high lamas had discovered, and which contained fabulous stores of knowledge and artifacts from an age when the earth was very young. Knowing my guide as well as I did, I knew it would be useless to expect to be told the story until he was ready. And that was not yet. Above us the stars shone in their glory, hardly dimmed by the rare pure air of Tibet. In the temples and lamasaries the lights were fading, one by one. From afar, carried on the night air, came the plaintive wail of a dog, and the answering barks of those in the village of Sho below us. The night was calm, placid even, and no clouds drifted across the face of the newly risen moon. Prayer flags hung limp and lifeless at their masts. From somewhere came the faint clacking of a prayer wheel, as some devout monk, encased in superstition and not aware of reality, twirled the wheel in the vain hope of gaining the favor of the gods. The Lama, my guide, smiled at the sound and said, To each according to his belief, to each according to his need. The trappings of ceremonial religion are solace to many. 
We should not condemn those who have not yet traveled far enough upon the path, nor are able to stand without crutches. I am going to tell you, Lobsang, of the nature of man. I felt very close to this man, the only one who had ever shown me consideration and love. I listened carefully in order to justify his faith in me. At least that is how I started. But I soon found the subject to be fascinating, and then I listened with unconcealed eagerness. The whole world is made of vibrations, all life. All that is inanimate consists of vibrations. Even the mighty Himalayas, said the Lama, are just a mass of suspended particles in which no particle can touch the other. The world, the universe, consists of minute particles of matter around which other particles of matter whirl, just as our sun has worlds circling around it, always keeping their distance, never touching, so is everything that exists composed of whirling worlds. He stopped and gazed at me, perhaps wondering if all this was beyond my understanding, but I could follow it with ease. He continued, The ghosts that we clairvoyant see in the temple are people, living people, who have left this world and entered into a state where their molecules are so widely dispersed that the ghosts can walk through the densest wall without touching a single molecule of that wall. Honorable Master, I said, why do we feel a tingle when a ghost brushes past us? Every molecule, every little sun and planet system, is surrounded by an electric charge, not the sort of electricity which man generates with machines, but a more refined type. The electricity which we see shimmering across the sky some nights, just as the earth has the northern lights of Aurora Borealis flickering at the poles, so has the meanest particle of matter its northern lights. A ghost coming too close to us imparts a mild shock to our aura, and so we get this tingle. About us the night was still. Not a breath of wind disturbed the quiet. There was a silence that one knows only in such countries as Tibet. The aura, then, that we see, is that an electric charge? I asked. Yes, replied my guide, the Lama Mingar Dondop. In countries outside of Tibet, where wires carrying electric current at high voltages are strung across the land, a corona effect is observed and recognized by electrical engineers. In this corona effect, the wires appear to be surrounded by a corona or aura of bluish light. It is observed mostly on dark, misty nights, but is of course there all the time for those who can see. He looked at me reflectively. When you go to Chongqing to study medicine, you will use an instrument which charts the electrical waves of the brain. All life, all that exists, is electricity and vibration. Now I am puzzled, I replied, for how can life be vibration and electricity? I can understand one, but not both. Ah! But my dear Lab Sang, laughed the Lama, there can be no electricity without vibration, without movement. It is movement which generates electricity. Therefore the two are intimately related. He saw my puzzled frown and with his telepathic powers read my thoughts. No, he said, just any vibration will not do. Let me put it to you in this way. Imagine a truly vast musical keyboard stretching from here to infinity. The vibration which we regard as solid will be represented by one note on that keyboard. The next might represent sound, and the next again will represent sight. Other notes will indicate feelings, senses, purposes, for which we have no understanding while upon this earth. A dog can hear higher notes than can a human, and a human can hear lower notes than can a dog. Words could be said to the dog in high tones which he could hear, and the human would know nothing of it. So can people of the so-called spirit world communicate with those yet upon this earth, when the earthling has the special gift of clear audience. The Lama paused and laughed lightly. I'm keeping you from your bed, Lao Tseng, but you shall have the morning off in order to recover. He motioned upwards toward the stars, glittering so brightly in the clear, clear air. Since visiting the cave of the ancients and trying the wonderful instruments there, instruments preserved intact since the days of Atlantis, I have often 
amused myself with the whimsy. I like to think of two small sentient creatures, smaller even than the smallest virus. It does not matter what shape they are, just agree that they are intelligent and have super, super instruments. Imagine them standing upon an open space of their own infinitesimal world, just as we are now. My, it is a beautiful night, exclaimed I, staring intently upwards at the sky. Yes, replied Be. It makes one wonder at the purpose of life. What are we? Where are we going? I pondered, gazing at the stars sweeping across the heavens in endless array, worlds without limits, millions, billions of them. I wonder how many are inhabited. Nonsense, sacrilege, ridiculous, stuttered Bay. You know there is no life except upon our world. For do not the priests tell us that we are made of the image of God? And how can there be other life unless it is exactly like ours? No, it is impossible. You are losing your wits. I muttered bad-temperedly to himself as he strode off. They could be wrong. You know, they could be wrong. The Lama Mingar donned up, smiled across at me, and said, I have even a sequel to it. Here it is. In some distant laboratory, with a science undreamed of by us, where microscopes of fantastic power were available, two scientists were working. One sat hunched up at a bench, eyes glued to the super-super microscope through which he gazed. Suddenly he started, pushing back his stool with a noisy scrape upon the polished floor. Look, John, he called to his assistant. Come and look at this. John rose to his feet, walked across to his excited superior, and sat down before the microscope. I have a millionth of a grain of lead sulfide on the slide, said the superior. Glance at it. John adjusted the controls and whistled with a startled surprise. My! he exclaimed. It is just like looking at the universe through a telescope. Blazing sun, orbiting planets. The superior spoke wistfully. I wonder if we shall have enough magnification to see down to an individual world. I wonder if there is life there. Nonsense, said John brusquely. Of course there is no sentient life. There cannot be. For do not the priests say that we are made in the image of God? How can there be intelligent life there? Over us the stars wheeled on their course, endless, eternal. Smiling, the Lama Mingar donned up, reached in his robe, and brought forth a box of matches. Treasure brought all the way from far off India. Slowly he extracted one match and held it up. I will show you creation, Lap sang, he said gaily. Deliberately he drew the match head across the igniting surface of the box, and as it flared into life he held up the blazing silver, then blew it out. Creation, disillusion, he said. The flaring match head emitted thousands of particles, each exploding away from its fellows. Each was a separate world. The whole was the universe and the universe died when the flame was extinguished. Can you say that there was no life on those worlds? I looked dubiously at him, not knowing what to say. If they were worlds, Lob sang, and had life upon them, to that life the worlds would have lasted for millions of years. Are we just a stricken match? Are we living here with our joys and sorrows, mostly sorrows, thinking that this is a world without end? Think about it and we will talk some more tomorrow. He rose to his feet and was gone from my sight. I stumbled across the roof and groped blindly for the top of the ladder, leading down. Our ladders were different from those used in the western world, consisting of notched poles. I found the first notch, the second, and the third. Then my foot slipped where someone had spilled butter from a lamp. Down I crashed, landing at the foot in a tangled heap, seeing more stars than there were in the sky above and raising many protests from sleeping monks. A hand appeared through the darkness and gave me a cuff that made bells ring in my head. Quickly I leaped to my feet and sped away into the safety of the enshrouding darkness. As quietly as possible I found a place in which to sleep, wrapped my robe around me and loosed my hold on consciousness. Not even the shush-shush of hurrying feet disturbed me, nor did the conscious or silver bells interrupt my dreams. The morning was far advanced, 
when I was awakened by someone enthusiastically kicking me. Blearly, I peered up into a face of a hulking teller. Wake up! Wake up! By the sacred dagger, you are a lazy dog! He kicked me again hard. I reached out, grabbed his foot, and twisted. With a bone-shaking jar, he fell to the floor, yelling, The Lord Abbot! The Lord Abbot! He wants to see you, you cross-grained idiot! Giving him a kick to make up for the many he had given me, I straightened my robe and hurried off. No food, no breakfast, I mumbled to myself. Why does everyone want me just when it is time to eat? Racing along the endless corridors, swinging round corners, I almost gave heart failure to a few old monks doddering around. But I reached the Lord Abbot's room in record time. Rushing in, I dropped to my knees and made my bows of respect. The Lord Abbot was perusing my record, and at one time I heard a hastily suppressed chuckle. Ah, the wild man who falls over cliffs, greases the bottom of stilts and causes more commotion than anyone else here. He paused and looked sternly at me. But you have studied well, extraordinary well, he said. Your metaphysical abilities are of such a high order, and you are so far advanced in your academic work that I'm going to have you specially and individually taught by the great Lama Minyardonda. You are given an unprecedented opportunity by the express command of His Holiness. Now report to the Lama your guide. Dismissing me with a wave of his hand, the Lord Abbot turned again to his papers. Relieved that none of my numerous sins had been found out, I hurried off. My guide, the Lama Mingyar Dondap, was sitting, waiting for me. Eyeing me keenly as I entered, he said, Have you broken your fast? No, sir, I said. The Reverend Lord Abbot sent for me while I was yet asleep. I'm hungry. He laughed at me and said, Ah, I thought you had a woebegone look as if you were being ill-used. Be off with you, get your breakfast, and then return here. I needed no urging. I was hungry and did not like it. Little did I know then, although it had been predicted, that hunger was to follow me through many years of my life. Refreshed by a good breakfast, but chastened in spirit at the thought of more hard work, I returned to the Lama Minyar Dundup. He rose to his feet as I entered. Come, he said. We're going to spend a week at the Patala. Leading the way, he strode out of the hall and out to where a groom monk was waiting with two horses. Gloomily, I surveyed the horse allotted to me. Even more gloomily, he stared at me, thinking less of me than I of him. With a feeling of impending doom, I mounted the horse and hung on. Horses were terrible creatures, unsafe, temperamental, and without brakes. Horse riding was the least of any accomplishment that I might have possessed. We jogged down the mountainous path from Chukpuri, crossing the Manalakheng Road, with the Pargo Kaling on our right. We soon entered the village of Sho, where my guide made a brief stop. Then we toiled up the steep steps of the Patala. Riding a horse up steps is an unpleasant experience, and my main concern was not to fall off. Monks, lamas, and visitors, an unceasing throng of them were trudging up and down the steps, some stopping to admire the view. Others, who had been received by the Dalai Lama himself, thought only of that interview. At the top of the steps we stopped, and I slid, gratefully but ungracefully, from my horse. He, poor fellow, gave a whinny of disgust and turned his back on me. On we walked, climbing ladder after ladder, until we reached the high level of the Patala, where the Lama Minyar Tondab had permanent rooms allotted to him near the Room of the Sciences. Strange devices from countries the world over were in that room, but the strangest devices of all were those from the remotest past. So at last we reached our destination, and I settled for a time in what was now my room. From my window, high up in the Patala, only one floor lower than the Dalai Lama, I could look out upon the Lhasa, upon the valley. Far off I could see the great cathedral Jokang, with golden roof agleam, the ring road of Lingkor stretched away in the distance, making a complete circuit of Lhasa city. Devout pilgrims thronged, all coming to offer prostrations at the world's greatest seat of occult learning. I marveled at my good fortune in having such a wonderful guide as a Lama Mingyar Dondab. Without him, I should have been an ordinary Chela, living in a dark dormitory instead of being almost on top of the world. Suddenly, so suddenly that I emitted a squeak of surprise, 
Strong arms grasped mine and lifted me in the air. A deep voice said, So, all you think of your guide is that he gets you high in the patala and feeds you those sickly sweet confections from India? He laughed down my protestations, and I was too blind or too confused to realize that he knew what I thought of him. At last, he said, We are in rapport. We knew each other well in a past life. You have all the knowledge of that past life and merely need to be reminded. Now we have to work. Come to my room. I straightened my rope and put back my bow which had fallen out when I was lifted into the air. Then I hurried to the room of my guide. He motioned for me to sit, and when I was settled, he said, And have you pondered on the matter of life, on our discussion of last night? I hung my head in some dismay as I replied, Sir, I had to sleep, then the Lord Abbot wanted to see me, then you wanted to see me, then I had to have food, and then you wanted to see me again. I have had no time to think of anything today. There was a smile on his face as he said, We are going to discuss later the effects of food, but first let us resume about life. He stopped and reached out for a book which was written in some outlandish foreign language. Now I know it was the English language. Turning over pages, he at last found that which he was seeking. Passing the book to me, opened at a picture, he asked, Do you know what that is? I looked at the picture, and it was so very ordinary that I looked at the strange words beneath. It meant nothing at all to me. Passing the book back, I said reproachfully, You know I cannot read, Honorable Lama. But you recognize the picture, he persisted. Well, yes, it is just a nature spirit, no different from anything here. I was becoming more and more puzzled. What was it all about? The Lama opened the book again and said, In a far-off country, across the seas, the general ability to see nature spirits has been lost. If one sees such a spirit, it is a matter for jest. The seer is literally accused of seeing things. Western people do not believe in things unless they can be torn to pieces or held in their hands or put in a cage. A nature spirit is termed a fairy in the West, and the fairy tales are not believed. This amazed me immensely. I could see spirits at all times and took them as absolutely natural. I shook my head to clear some of the fog out of it. The Lama Mignard Dondab spoke, all life, and as I told you last night, consist of rapidly vibrating matter generating an electrical charge. The electricity is the life of matter. As in music, there are various octaves. Imagine that the ordinary man in the street vibrates on a certain octave. Then a nature spirit and a ghost will vibrate at a higher octave. Because the average man lives and thinks and believes on one octave only, people of other octaves are invisible to him. I fiddled with my robe, thinking it over. It did not make sense to me. I could see ghosts and nature spirits, therefore anyone should see them also. The Lama, reading my thoughts, replied, You see the aura of humans. Most other humans do not. You see nature spirits and ghosts. Most other humans do not. All very young children see such things, because the very young are more receptive. Then as the child grows older, the cares of living coarsens the perceptions. In the West, children who tell their parents that there has been a game with spirit playmates are punished for telling lies, or are laughed at for their vivid imagination. The child resents such treatment and after a time convinces himself that it was all imagination. You, because of your special upbringing, see ghosts and nature spirits, and you always will, just as you will always see the human aura. Then even the nature spirits who tend flowers are the same as us, I asked. Yes, he replied, the same as us, except they vibrate faster, and their particles of matter are more diffused. That is why you can put your hand right through them, just as you can put your hand right through a sunbeam. Have you ever touched, you know, hell, the ghost? I queried. Yes, I have, he replied. It can be done if one raises one's own rate of vibrations. I will tell you about it. My guide touched his silver bell, a gift from a high abbot of one of Tibet's better-known lamasaries. The monk servant, knowing us well, brought not sampa, but tea from Indian plants, and those sweet cakes which were carried across the high mountains, especially for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. 
and which I, just a poor cella, enjoyed so much. Reward for special efforts at study. As His Holiness had often said, the Lama of Mignard Dondap had toured the world, both in the physical and the astral forms. One of his very few weaknesses was an addiction to Indian tea, a weakness which I heartily endorsed. We settled down comfortably, and as soon as I had finished my cakes, my guide and friend spoke. Many years ago, when I was a young man, I scurried round a corner here at the Patala, just as you do, Lab sang. I was late for service, and to my horror I saw a portly abbot blocking my way. He was hurrying, too. There was no time to avoid him. I was rehearsing my apology when I crashed right through him. He was as alarmed as I. However, I was so bemused that I kept on running, and so was not late. Not too late, after all. I laughed, thinking of the dignified Lama Mignard Dondup scurrying. He smiled at me and continued. Late that night I thought about it. I thought, why shouldn't I touch a ghost? The more I thought about it, the more determined I was that I would touch one. I laid my plans carefully and read all the old scripts about such matters. I also consulted a very, very learned man who lived in a cave high in the mountains. He told me much. He put me on the right path. And I'm going to tell you the same, because it leads directly to the theme of touching a ghost. He poured himself some more tea and sipped a while before continuing. Life, as I told you, consists of a mass of particles, little worlds circling around little suns. The motion generates a substance which, for want of a better term, we call electricity. If we eat sensibly, we can increase our rate of vibration. A sensible diet, none of the crank cult ideas, increases one's health, increases one's basic rate of vibration. So we come near to the ghost rate of vibration. He stopped and lit a fresh stick of incense. Satisfied that the end was glowing satisfactory, he turned his attention again to me. The sole purpose of incense is to increase the rate of vibration in the area in which it is burned, and the rate of those within that area. By using the correct incense, for all are designed for a certain vibration, we can attain certain results. For a week I held myself to a rigid diet, one which increased my vibration or frequency. For that week also I continually burned the appropriate incense in my room. At the end of that time I was almost out of myself. I felt that I floated rather than walked. I felt the difficulty of keeping my astral form within my physical. He looked at me and smiled as he said, You would not have appreciated such a restricted diet. No, I thought, I would rather touch a square meal than any good ghost. At the end of the week, said the Lama, my guide, I went down to the inner sanctuary and burned more incense while I implored a ghost to come and touch me. Suddenly I felt the warmth of a friendly hand on my shoulder. Turning to see who was disturbing my meditation, I almost jumped straight out of my robe when I saw that I was being touched by the spirit of one who had died more than a year ago. The Lama Mignard Dondam stopped abruptly, then laughed out loud as he thought of that long past experience. Lab sang, he exclaimed at last. The old dead Lama laughed at me and asked me why I had gone to all that trouble when all I had to do was to go into that astral form. I confess that I felt mortified beyond measure to think that such an obvious solution had escaped me. Now, as you well know, we do go into the astral to talk to ghost and nature people. Of course, you spoke by telepathy, I remarked, and I do not know of any explanation for telepathy. I do it, but how do I do it? You ask the most difficult questions, Lab Seng, laughed my guide. The simplest things are the most difficult to explain. Tell me. How would you explain the process of breathing? You do it, everyone does it, but how does one explain the process? I nodded gloomily. I knew I was always asking questions, but that was the only way to get to know things. Most of the other chalas were not interested. As long as they had their food and not too much work, they were satisfied. I wanted more. I wanted to know. The brain, said the Lama, is like a radio set, like the device which that man Marconi is using to send messages across the ocean. The collection of particles and electrical charges which constitutes a human being has the electrical or radio 
device of the brain to tell it what to do. When a person thinks of moving a limb, electric currents race out along the appropriate nerves to galvanize the muscles into the desired action. In the same way, when a person thinks radio or electrical waves, actually they come from the higher part of the radio spectrum, are radiated from the brain. Certain instruments can detect the radiations and can even chart them into what the Western doctors term alpha, beta, delta, and gamma lines. I nodded slowly. I had already heard of such things from the medical llamas. Now, my guide continued, sensitive persons can detect these radiations also and can understand them. I read your thoughts and when you try, you can read mine. The more two people are in sympathy and harmony with each other, the easier it is for them to read these brain radiations which are thoughts. So we get telepathy. Twins are often quite telepathic to each other. Identical twins, where the brain of one is a replica of the other, are so telepathic each to the other that it is often difficult indeed to determine which one originated a thought. Respect it, sir, I said. As you know, I can read most minds. Why is this? Are there many more with this particular ability? You, Lab Sang, replied my guide, are especially gifted and specially trained. Your powers are being increased by every method at our command, for you have a difficult task in the life ahead of you. He shook his head solemnly. A difficult task indeed. In the old days, Lab Sang, mankind could commune telepathically with the animal world. In the years to come, after mankind has seen the folly of wars, the power will be regained. Once again, man and animal will walk in peace together, neither desiring to harm the other. Below us, a gong boomed and boomed again. There came the blare of trumpets, and the Lama Mignard donned up, jumped to his feet, saying, We must hurry, Lab Sang. The temple service is about to commence, and His Holiness himself will be there. I hastily rose to my feet, rearranged my robe, and rushed after my guide, now far down the corridor and almost out of sight.